Well, brethren, it's a Sabbath for us here, very unusual Sabbath. The gusts of wind, which are very unusual, orcan gusts of winds, are, are hitting us. And this is the first time that my country and my town is experiencing that to the point that the cats are <laughs> very, the animals are very upset because they've never experienced anything like this. Uh, you know, the wind blowing through the, you know, through the whole town, through the windows, through the doors, uh, uh, moving some stuff around. And of course, the animals are very puzzled and so are us humans. In any case, many people, speaking of being puzzled, many people around the world are puzzled about teachings of the Bible. The Bible is like a code book, as we know, and um, the Bible is not easily understood. That's why God God raised his church, uh, in our case here, Hope of Israel Worldwide Church of God, to uh, be explaining and expounding the word of God and to be teaching people all the things that Jesus Christ commanded and taught his disciples. Now, in the world, as well as in the Bible, there are various in this religious vocabulary, so to so to speak, especially in the West, and that, that religious vocabulary through their missionaries has spilled over to the rest of the world. You have all kinds of um, religious terminology that are not really well understood. Among those terminologies are repentance, baptism, justification, uh, grace, law, and so on and so forth. And of course, the whole Christian so-called world is completely mixed up or confused. Uh, the churchianity is like a modern Babylon, a, a modern set of confusion that simply does not understand what the Bible teaches. Now, we are the people of God, and of course, uh, we have been called by the God. And we know that our, primarily, uh, our primary, that is, uh, obligation before God is what Solomon well put in his in his writings saying uh, this is what is up to men you know the man what well, this is his responsibility uh, keep the commandments and fear the Lord for that is all the duty of the man and that's exactly the truth but however regardless of that keeping the commandments of God we don't keep the commandments to be saved number one because keeping of the law cannot save anyone we are saved by the grace and in faith into the in blood and sacrifice of Jesus Christ however brethren please do not mix that with your life because in Romans he says that we are alive and we are living by his resurrection you see number one so his sacrifice was there to pay the penalty for our sins and then he rose from the dead so he is now a living savior a living mediator between us and God and we are alive still of course, we are alive because of his sac because of his uh, resurrection, because of his life. However, we are alive being justified. All right, so that is the topic of today, justification. What is justification? You can name this. Uh, uh, you can name this uh, message justification. Your your new lease on life. All right. So now, just imagine we those of us who don't live. In the Western world, we have seen it on the on 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 various movies. We have seen the governors who can pardon various uh, offenders. So I know that you you are guilty of the crime. Just imagine a governor that states that. But I believe that you are truly sorry and will not do it again. Therefore, I hereby pardon you and release you to society. On your honor, you now have a new lease of life. Now these words that I've just that I've just made up, <laughs> the words of this governor perfectly illustrate the Bible doctrine of justification, brethren. But how many Christians truly understand this subject? And I don't care about the Christians in the world; they don't understand almost anything. Anyway, they're just completely confused. They live in the Babylon of confusion. But brethren, we are true Christians when we, of course, believe. On the saving grace and saving power of Jesus Christ and we are true Christians if we keep God's law without any compromise so how many Christians how many true Christians do understand the subject of justification and there's you know as I said there is this religious vocabulary there that these nominal Christians use all the time you know grace law you know repentance baptism justification this that and the other and we should not be confused. We are true Christians. We must understand. They just get on the confusion from the Bible. They just took it from the Bible and they just all mix it up. 
you know. And uh, what's the understanding of that? Well, what is justification when it comes to the Bible? How do we pr pr understand that? We've been reading the book of Jeremiah in the past few weeks, and we'll continue to read the book of Jeremiah, of course, but, you know, it's December already. Uh, the time is flying by so quickly that the Passover might be quicker upon us than we thought. And, uh, and you know, because the, the time is going on, I'm thinking the preparation for this coming Passover, brethren, should be educating us. We have to get educated about what is true repentance. What is really, re when you know, what is the requirement for baptism? We should, for those who are not baptized, we should be knowing what is justification. And we need to be under, we need to be educated. You know, I'm preparing a set of doctrinal outlines. Doctrinal outlines when all of these in, important subjects, including the gospel, including the tongue question, including all the most relevant basic questions that you have as Christians, will be responded to in a biblical, from a biblical perspective, with certain scriptures there, with a plain, with plain, set, uh, with a set of plain uh, explanations. So that you can understand it in plain language. Brethren, we have to be educated because we are the royal priesthood, the Apostle Peter says in his epistle. The priests in the ancient time, when Israel Israel was rescued from the from the from its bondage, the priests were the most literate and the most educated part of the society. Now we as true Christians today, in this Babylon of confusion, we must be literate and biblically, biblically educated, brethren. I've been stressing this over and over and over again. You know, we cannot be like zombies keeping the Ten Commandments and think that's oh wonderful. Oh, that's wonderful. We keep the Sabbath and all this. The rest of the world keeps Sunday. Oh, look how superior we are. No, we are not, brethren. We're not superior at all. Unless we have the certain knowledge to back, back it up. If I would ask you, why do we keep the Sabbath? I don't know what why I get as a response. But I'll tell you very plainly what is their true re response is. Out of love for God, we keep the Sabbath. Because there is, when you think about it logically, is there any reason, logical reason, why anybody here, now, in this world, would keep the Sabbath and put it himself or herself at odds with the rest of the world by keeping the day that everybody scorns? Is there any logical reason? No, there is not. That's why the Sabbath is the test commandment, you see? Because it tests do you love God to the point that you'll keep it. Do you really love God or not? But nevertheless, you have the rest of the world in this Babylon of confusion. You have all of these religious institutions, colleges, you know, uh, 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 centers, Coming up with all of this, with all of this terminology, religious terminology, which is in the Bible, including the word justification, you know. And if somebody would ask you, you know, what is justification, most of you, I don't know what we would say. That's why I'm preparing this doctrinal, a set of doctrinal outlines with the most important basic things that all the, all the Christians, true Christians, it's a doctrinal outlines for true Christians that they should know. Yes, it's good that we keep the Ten Commandments. It's good that we keep the Sabbath, brethren, but that doesn't make us any superior. We are being called as, as, the, as the first fruits of salvation for a certain reason. And since we will be the, in the world to come, in the world tomorrow, in the kingdom of God, we're supposed to, to be the teachers and, and priests and, and, and kings and queens. Since we're going to be the teachers, we have to understand and master some of the basic uh, Bible doctrines now. And that's why you'll have, I don't think of any church institution, I'm speaking about the Church of God as a, as a, as a spiritual organism, I don't really know of any preparing such a good and, and, and excellent and succinct and summarized set of literature that is going to, 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 to educate its members. Recently we came up with a booklet, small booklet, uh, it's rather an article, but nevertheless, it's about the agriculture, biblical principles of agriculture. As far as I know, we are the first of all the churches of God around the world who has told you that you have to have ethical treatment of animals. It is right there in the Bible screaming at us, brethren. And yet, there are various things screaming at us from the Bible, but these various churches of God just, just, just don't want to address it, you know. So nobody speaks about the second exodus, which is very prominent, 
subject in the Bible. If you don't know what is Second Exodus, it's right there on my YouTube channel. You can find a whole sermon on it with references to the Bible. Principles of agriculture, yes, it's right there. Ethical treatment of animals. Ethical treatment of animals, especially for you living in the third world, when we know how animals are being exploited and treated. It's ethical treatment for animals. It's a commandment for you and me. It's a commandment for all humanity. We have to, as people of God, we have to excel, excel. We have to excel in the standards of living. We have to be ambassadors for Christ and to show to these dying societies around us in every way, shape or form how different the way of God is from all the gentile, pagan, apostate ways of this world, brethren. Don't take it lightly because we have all been influenced by our, by our popular cultures in which we live, you know. And we certainly do know that certain customs of our popular cultures have nothing to do with Christ, have nothing to do with Christianity, have nothing to do with the Apostle, and so on and so forth. And I usually take treatment of animals very seriously because I know I also live in the third world and I've seen since my childhood until now the treatment of animals, how people have it. Animals were created by God. Now let me tell you this, and I keep pondering about this, this question. Those who abuse the animals will face the judgment of God. Because mistreating what God has created, it's not only nature, it's not only trees, not only flowers, not only the soil. It's the living creatures that God has created. Go to the, back to the Genesis and then you see how God created each animal after its own kind. We have to be ambassadors for Christ. Our homes, I hope, will become embassies of Christ. True Christ. Not the Christ that has been created in the minds of this perverted Christianity, you know, that just confuses the world with all these various doctrines like justification, this, that, and the other. They've got false Christ. You know, they're Christ like a wimpy, wimpy little Christ who is still, who is still, for many of them, still hanging on the cross. Brethren, he's not hanging on the cross. He has come down from the cross he has been raised back to life and he's now at the right hand of god or it's a wimpy christ who wouldn't have swat the fly or he is like no really oh really well just read me in the gospel when he addresses the pharisees brood of vipers he says hypocrites and so on now should we be doing going around telling people like that no we shouldn't that's that's not what we should show them by the action by our way of life we should show them that we're different that we belong to a different kingdom. And if we belong to a different kingdom, kingdom of God, then we have to be ambassadors for that true Christ coming to bring that kingdom to this earth. Brethren, we have to understand our calling is much more serious sometimes than just merely changing the days when we that we keep. You know, we keep the holidays and we keep the Sabbath. And many people think that's the end of Christian life. Oh, we are just... No, it's not. No, it's not. Why do we keep the Sabbath? Why do we keep the holidays? Well, we keep out of love for God. Not because we are something superior than the other human beings. No, we were just as deceived as they are. We were just revealed by God a different way of life. But when you analyze, when you stop and analyze very popular cultural things and trends in your societies, then you have to realize that how different you have to be. You have to be different in character. Because what is permeating our societies, envy, jealousy, lust, stupid, stupid advertisements on TV, stupid TV programs, corrupted governments, corrupted humans after all, and so on and so on and so forth. Brethren, our calling, I'm, I'm addressing this for the first time, we have this number of people here, number of people from around the world now, uh, uh, in this number I'm addressing you because yes, it's explosion of, of interest and thirst for God's word, yes I understand and I'm happy about it and I'm going to serve to the best of my capacity and all that I can to, 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 to true Christians, but brethren, we have to understand what true Christianity is all about. If the word of God is so effective that it just uh, uh, separates morrow from bones, that it just 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 examines our, our motives and our hearts and minds, then in our standards of living and standards of behavior, in our words, in our composure, in our in our attitude, we have to be ambassadors for Christ. 
you know, and being ambassadors for Christ doesn't mean that we just go around and, 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 and scream, oh, Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world. No! Let people see that Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world through our example. That's what it means to be Christian. Follow the example of Jesus Christ. And when you follow the example of Jesus Christ, when people see it in action, they'll have to stop and think, what makes these people different? Well, it's the Spirit of, of God, indeed. And they will have to really recognize one day, tomorrow, or, to, to, you know, or, or, or even today, some of them today, many of them tomorrow, that there is a different force at work in our lives, brethren. One day they'll understand what it is. But in the meantime, we have to be ambassadors for Jesus Christ. People are to be, supposed to be see Christ in our, in our lives, in our works, in our approach. In our difference from our popular cultures around us. So you have to understand that. You have to understand that we have to, what we have to overcome. That will be one of the... One of the subjects will be what we have to overcome. We have to overcome a world around us. Well, the world around us is all wrong. Why? Because of wrong attitudes. Because of wrong mindsets. Brethren, that's what it is. If we are to be God's people, if we are to be true Israelites, led by the Spirit of God, we have to be different from the society around us. Very different. We don't have to be clashing with the society with that because that's not the time yet. But, you know, in the world tomorrow, we are supposed to be administering what we have learned right now during our lifetime. So I want your local congregations to become schools in the most positive and most affirmative way. Schools. In which they're going to be learning things which we have not learned at schools anyway. And that's why we have been, as the Hope of Israel, well, we have been producing teaching materials. We already have difficult scriptures explained. We have now various booklets. Even the latest one came out was on the Kingdom of God. And interestingly enough, that, that subject all of a sudden became the focal interest in Africa, kingdom of God. You know, whether kingdom will be in heaven or will, be, will it be on the earth? And our representative there, John Ovak, well, he well sensed that, that thing and he said we need to have the booklet on the kingdom of God. And sure enough, this week we just produced the booklet on the kingdom of God. But we produced it in a language that everybody can understand, brethren. It's not an academic language. Is the language of the which common people, ordinary people like myself, ordinary members of the church put together, then I just review it all, of course, and then we just come up with something that is sensible, understandable, uh, 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 receptive to the, to, the, to, the, to the rest of you. Yes, it's true. Most of us are not academically uh, educated. Most of us are not academically uh, outstanding in our societies because God has called the worst of the world, but he, de he didn't mean that we should stay the worst of the world. So, as we are analyzing the book of Jeremiah these days, and we'll be analyzing the books of other prophets as well, in the meantime, I just want, since, the, since time is flying and the pastor is coming up, I want to tell you, I want to instill in you that you have to be ambassadors for Jesus Christ. As it says in 2 Corinthians, those who don't know, please go to chapter 5 and check it for yourself what you're supposed to be. Why, do we, why did we have ambassador college once upon a time in the last century? Well, because of the word ambassador, at least in our Western, Western rendering, appears in the Bible. That we are ambassadors for Christ. What is an ambassador? If you don't know, just Google it out. Representative of a foreign country. We are ambassadors for Christ and we represent true Jesus Christ if we are to, if we represent him, if we live as he lived. That's what it means to be Christian, brethren. It's much bigger. We keep the holidays and the Sabbath because he kept it. Yes, indeed. Because he commanded it to us. Yes, indeed. But what about our characters? What about our motives? You know, recently I've had I had a very unpleasant duty that I had to disfellowship even a couple of people here in Serbia from Hope of Israel. 
because their motives were rotten, because their, 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 their attitudes were horrendous, their rebellion against the government of God even more. So there was no choice. But brethren, Jesus Christ is going to disfellowship us from the kingdom if we don't be, well, no matter how much we keep the Sabbath and the holidays, and no matter how much we eat, eat, eat clean food, if our hearts and our minds do not get changed, we are going to be disfellowshipped from the kingdom of God. And if you don't believe that, you can go to Ezekiel chapter 36 and 37, when God is going to put, put the two sticks together, the house of Judah and the house of Israel, and then they will become one nation again, when God says then, and I will change their hearts and their minds, and no longer will they be this rebellious. Exactly, brethren. The subject of scattering of Israelites all over the world, in all the nations and in all the races, is a special subject, you know. That's why we're called hope of Israel, because hope of Israel is hope of all the nations anyway. And it's coming from Jeremiah chapter 17 for those who do not understand where this come from. In fact, the original word hope says Mikve Israel. Mikve Israel. You know, it's in Hebrew, of course. Alluding to the ceremonial cleansing of, 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 of immersion in the Old Testament, which was the precursor of the Christian baptism in the New. And that's, the, of course, the hope that we all have for our loving, loving nations. We do have, and that's why I said uh, before this message, I said to, to some, one of you, spread the gospel but be wise not all people are called to salvation now it is it is it is imperative to understand that but it is also imperative to understand other doctrines that should be part of our lives so one of those doctrines is justification and i just in in this introduction of this message i just quoted to you <laughs> imagine governor who is partnering somebody so question to you how much do you understand about justification? Hopefully you'll understand it more after this message. And with all these, all these subjects that are very vital to Christian life, you have to be teaching your congregations. We don't need a bunch of dummies to be a bunch of dummies or to have a bunch of dummies in hope of Israel. They just oh, they just go to the church on, sun, on, 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 on the Sabbath and on the holidays and wonderful look how they different are and they just feel superior and they just look down upon the others and oh, no, not at all. We need people who keep the Sabbath and the holidays thinking and knowing what is behind all of that and knowing that they are doing that because God revealed it to them and because God has called them before all the rest of humanity. That's all. It's time for us to become people. We don't have to have, the, uh, you know, uh, if we can be educated, of course, even in this world, I, that's okay. You know, to have various degrees and 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 and, and uh, diplomas that we can use for for employment or for teaching. There'll be somebody who will be in teaching fields and so on. That's fine. But in the world to come, in the kingdom of God, we're going to be teaching people, teaching people. We're going to teach people the way of salvation, the way of God. And there are certain things in the Bible like justification that we need to pay. You know, we need to teach others properly. And that's why I just want all of your local churches to become to become colleges and schools, as one of my cousins used to put. He hasn't been he he attended for a while with us. He said schools for eternal life. That's how he would put it, and he's right. And school for eternal life is not just that we keep the Sabbath and the holidays. It's part of the school of life. The school of eternal life is that we understand, that we start to understand perhaps some deeper subjects that this Babylon around us is hitting us with and trying to confuse us as it, is, it has been confusing the rest of the world. So what do we understand about justification? Well, brother, we must, if we are to enter God's kingdom, for no one can be saved without being justified from sin. And this is so important, so let me just repeat it. So we must understand what justification is from biblical perspective, because if we are to enter God's kingdom, we, we, if we want to enter it, we cannot be saved without being justified from sin. 
And what is justification? Okay, let's give it some basic doctrine. Justification is the process by which God forgives a person's sins by grace through faith. Have you noticed? I didn't say by keeping the Sabbath and holidays, by keeping the law. No, brethren. We keep the law out of love for God. To return that love for Him. We don't keep it to be saved. Please keep that in mind. We are justified in the process by our sins. Personal sins are forgiven by God. But they are forgiven not because we now keep the commandments. But by grace through faith. It implies not only forgiveness. But imputing to the person a positive state of righteousness in God's eyes. Imputing, you see. Not that we are righteous by, oh, we were born in the world, we are so righteous by keeping the Sabbath and all this. No. As I said, we keep the commandments out of love for God. We return that love. It's required? Yes, it is. It's something that will keep, lead us into the kingdom? Yes, it is. But it does not justify us from sin. We are justified by, as I said, we're justified by, uh, from sin by, by grace through faith. And there is nothing you can do in the world to earn that grace or to earn that, you know, that justification. It's a process that God imputes to us. Just like what it says in the Psalms. He, 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 he loves us. He spares us like a, a father spares his own son. He loves us. That's what it is, brethren. We need to understand that as well. So yes, the law, the law has a place in Christian life. Absolutely. Surely. Undoubtedly, because the law is there to develop in us what? To develop in us what? The character of God, the character of Christ. Brother, without that character, we cannot enter the kingdom of God. So we keep the law and the law. By keeping the law, we are being built, you know, we are building appreciation for all that God is. Because half of this law speaks about how to keep the law to uh, serve him properly. And the other half of the law, basically roughly half of the law, speaks how to treat our fellow humans so that we can indeed develop that character of God ever thought of that the first half of the law up to the fourth commandment it speaks about you know not to use God's name in vain not to have idols not to worship other gods then it comes to keep the proper day which is a sign by the way the Sabbath is a sign between who between God and his people it's not a sign between us and the world so if you have been preaching about, you know, the importance of Sabbath, yes. But preach it to the world, to those who keep it already. Those who don't keep it to them, Sabbath doesn't mean anything. But if they see you being people of integrity, being people of honesty, being people that never lie, that never will compromise, when they see your example, <coughs> when they see Christ in you, then they will stop and think, well, wait a second. Wait a second. What is the driving force in the life of these people? Oh, what is it? There must be some other force stronger than them. Yes, there is. It's the God of Israel. It's the God of Israel as he is revealed. He reveals himself in the Bible as God of Israel. There is no reason that we should not call him God of Israel. That's what he is. Because Israel has been scattered all over the place after it's lost its own, its own homeland. It's lost its own identity. Israel has been scattered all over the place. Hear me, all of you from other countries. Those of you who think, oh, we are black. There must not be, oh, no, really? Oh, really? Well, those of you who are black, shall I tell you that you're, you're, you're one of your country in, 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 in Africa, Ethiopia, until the 8th century of our era has kept Sabbath as the official day of rest. Now you tell me why. Do you know why? How oh, well. Well, because the Ethiopia used to be a kingdom and there was a queen of Sheba that went to Solomon and there is a tradition that she conceived a son and there came, came the royal royal family. Well, she conceived son with Solomon who was of Israel. He was the king of Israel. And it's only one example. It's only one example of scattering of Israelites. Those of you who are in Asia, oh, you would think, why would... Well, wait a second, do you know that in Chinese, in Chinese tradition, there is a talk about the white hoons. White hoons that came to China, clashed with local, local military, and then Chinese sources tell us they went to Scandinavia. Oh, wait, 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 really? But how many of them stayed behind? 
And plus, very recently that you should know, the Japanese scholars have uh, informed some of us that they have discovered that the Hebrews, as they say, the Hebrews participated in the foundation of their nation. <laughs> to them, it's a shocking discovery, and to me, it was a logical discovery, because all the way, the royal family, the Tsar family of Japan, has got a lotus, lotus flower. And lotus flower was present on Solomon's temple, by the way. So where did the, the, the royal family of Japan got the lotus flower from? What do you think? Well, from those Hebrews who participated, obviously, in the foundation of the, of the modern Japanese nation. There is talk about how many of, of Israelites have been, have been lost and scattered in India. Do you know that there is an apostle, Thomas, who went where? Where he went to India. To preach the gospel, the true gospel. Do you know that? Well, why would he go to India? Because the, uh, Jesus Christ told the apostles, you shall not go to anywhere else. You should but only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And those of you who think perhaps that the apostles did not know where the house of Israel is scattered, please just, just review the starting, the beginning verse in the book of James in your free time. And try to explain to me how could James formulate such a verse if he and the rest of the apostles and Jesus Christ, who was their head, did not know where the true the twelve tribes go. Why would Jesus Christ tell the apostles just don't go to the into the house of Samaria, into the towns of Samaritans, do not enter their house, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel? Why would he say that to the apostles if he didn't know where the lost sheep were? And they were everywhere, everywhere. You should take a look at when we will, well, one day we will be we're going to analyze the uh, the the the, um, the prophet one of the prophets anyway the one after Daniel in our in our uh, in our canon you will be surprised and what is the first when you go to the very first chapter of that one you'll be surprised you see a farmer coming out on the farm. A farmer coming out of the farm and doing what? Just throwing the seed all over the place. All over, all over, all over the place. Hosea, the prophet Hosea. Scatters the seed. The seed falls everywhere. Everywhere. Listen to me. Everywhere. And that was the that was the picture of the house of Israel as Amos 9 and 9 tells us being scattered everywhere. All over the earth, all over the world, all over the globe, everywhere. Those of you in India should think about Brahma, Brahma, Brahmans, Brahmans. Well, doesn't that doesn't that sound to you like Abraham a little bit? <laughs> Do you think? And why should you all should any be surprised? The prophecy for the house of Israel was this. God told them, my children, you want to be pagans all the time. You want to be pagans, I tell you. Listen to me, follow my ways. But no, you just want to follow other gods. You want to follow how other people serve their gods. Wonderful. Because of that, I'm going to scatter you everywhere. Like that farmer that goes out and just scatters the seed everywhere. And... You're going to lose your identity, my dear children of Israel. However, I'll know exactly where you are. But you're going to lose your identity. How? You're going to become somebody else. That's what you always wanted. You never wanted to be my people. You just wanted to be other people that serve other gods. Fine, I'll just let you do that. You're going to lose your identity in all the nations that you go. You'll become pagans. And you'll lose your, 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 your awareness of who you are. But I'll still know where you are. Because I'm a faithful God of Israel. 
And then all of a sudden, some of you in, in, in all these various places, you just wake up and all of a sudden you start reading the Bible and all of a sudden it all just makes sense and all of a sudden you feel you don't belong to this world, to this nation, to this culture. Have you ever wondered why? Well, because you're most likely somewhere down the line of your genealogy, you're Israelites, you know. Your ancestors simply just came came to your lands, then over the time they just got assimilated. That's exactly what was prophesied in the Bible. They got assimilated into your cultures. They lost their identity. And here is God now in the last days, waking us up to our identity. It's one of the crucial, one of the crucial matters. And almost 40 years after Herbert Armstrong's death, here we have now the truth about Israel. We have the book of the truth about Israel based completely on all the things that he understood. And we understand even more now because he said in his time, I'm understanding only the trunk of the tree. He was right. We're discovering much more now. And those of you living in Asia, listen to this, according to some modern scholars who are, who are, who are uh, 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 researching the subject. And by the way, right now in India, in Mizoram, there is a conference on House of Israel. But there is a there is a, 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 a speculation, let's say it, that about two billion people of Asia have got Israel at its origin. Oh, really? Well, why should you be shocked? What was the promise? I'll multiply your seed as the stars in heaven, as the sand of the on 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 on, on and the sand on the seashore, such that nobody could number them. So why should you be surprised that there are two billion, perhaps, descendants of Israelites in Asia? Shouldn't shock anyone. It should shock you if you don't think about it. You know. But we have now the book of the body Israel. Excellent book of the body Israel. With all the biblical references, with all the explanations. And now when it comes to Israel, we understand much better than ever. That's why we are called Hope of Israel. Because Israel is everywhere, everywhere, all over the place. Yes, some of them have concentrated in certain places because they had to fulfill the end time prophecies for the Jacob's descendants as listed in Genesis chapter 49. Some of them, but many of them are not in those places. Many of them are scattered all over Africa, all over Asia, all over the world, brethren. Time for you to understand that. And being Israelites, it means we are to be royal priesthood in the world to come. That's what God said to Israel when they when they left Egypt, you know. You are to be to me kings and priests. And then the Apostle Peter repeats that in the New Testament, that we, God's people, are to be kings and priests. So I'm just asking you justification, what it is. I just told you, I'll just repeat it again. The process by which God forgives a person's sins by grace through faith, not by keeping the law. And it implies not only forgiveness, but imputing to the person a positive state of righteousness in God's eyes. It's not earned through obedience to God's law, but it requires repentance and keeping God's law, you see. Once you repent of your sins and start keeping God's law, with you turn to God, then, you know, then we become justified for our sins because we have shown through repentance that no longer do we want to sin. Now, of course, the world lives in this total, total churchianity, in this total confusion, because some people don't have a clear idea in the midst about just what justification means because they confuse it with related but separate subject of faith, grace, and law, you see. And we'll address all those subjects before, hopefully, the Passover next year. Brethren, we will uh, address it all because I want God's people to be educated and I want God's people to be, they have to share that knowledge in the world to come when all the people, you know, will be subject to the law and to the government of the, of the kingdom of God. Later on in the second resurrection, the general resurrection of the dead will have to be teaching countless millions of our kinsmen and all the rest of humanity, all of these things. 
And therefore, we cannot be dummies who say, oh, well, we're just ordinary people. We're not really academics. and we, Well, we are. Yes, we are. But it doesn't mean that we're going to be spiritual dummies, if you want. I want us to be strong in the faith because that sometimes is going to is going to really uh, uh, make you make you make you stand for the faith when you have to because the Babylon always wants this confusion always wants to get to all of us and the Bab these Babylonian churches churches all over the place all that they want and they just hate God's law they hate what is true biblical doctrine so they've been doing it for centuries now trying to suppress it and destroy it and yes, they will hate us who are just not going to succumb to all of that. Yes, they will hate us, but that's fine. They hated Jesus Christ. They hated the apostles. They hated the prophets. And in, in, in the words of Apostle Peter, they hate you for you're not running into their, into their chaotic way of life. I'm paraphrasing, but that's you understand what I mean. That's what it means to be Christian, brethren. That's what it means to be Christian. We're ambassadors of true Jesus Christ. Living contrary to, spiritually contrary, primarily in character and spirit, contrary to the ways of this society. Primarily. And again, I would much rather that people know you as being honest, truthful, uh, uh, not, never lying, never doing any wrong to anyone, never abusing animals, never doing anything horrible. I would much rather people know you for that and say, whoa, whoa, wait a second, these people are something. Rather than knowing, oh, they keep, they, they keep the Sabbath. And so what? So many people keep the Sabbath and behave just like the world around them. So what's, what's the point of the Sabbath? You know, the Sabbath is something that is between us and God. It has nothing to do with the world. So stop thinking that because you keep the Sabbath and the holidays that you're something terribly, terribly superior and important. It's part, only part of Christian life. But the main part is this. Understanding true Bible doctrines and, and allowing the Spirit of God to change your character inside because we inside all have rotten characters. The heart, we read in Jeremiah 17 and 9, the heart is deceitful. The heart of every one of us is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. That's the diagnosis we all have, brethren. That heart has to change. If you don't allow the Spirit of God to change it, and if you're not making efforts to allow spirit, the Spirit of God to change it, then you'll be just rotten apples. Like some have become here in Serbia, you'll become rotten apples that are just good for nothing. Just like that soul that loses its saltness, it's good for nothing just to be tossed out and, and shredded. So we don't need to have a then we don't need to be ourselves a bunch of dummies and have a bunch of congregations with a bunch of dummies that just they just not no 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 nothing else but they oh we need but we hey we keep the Sabbath and we keep the holidays. Look how wonderful we are. Brethren, that's how many people think. Or many people also think, in my recent experience, if they are associate with the right organization that that's their 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 carte blanche that's their 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 entrance into the kingdom of god no or their entrance into the place of safety no no we have to allow the spirit of god and we have to allow the spirit of god to change our deceitful hearts within us our perverted minds within us brethren People have to see Christ in us through our example. If they see that, we have achieved the goal. If they know us only for keeping the Sabbath holidays, but we are just like the rest of the world, perhaps even worse than many people in the world, then what, what good is all of that? Then we will become, we'll become like people who could be, uh, whose example could be taken to, to blaspheme the truth of God, as it says in Peter. That's how important all of this is. That's how serious all of this is. And you may wonder, what does this have to, have to do with justification? Well, a lot. Because people who are justified, because they have really truly repented, and will come to repentance later, what is true repentance, and all of that, people who have come you know, to understand, and people who are justified, they're supposed to be true ambassadors for Jesus Christ, among other things. There are people in the world, speaking of the world, that believe that we are justified by works instead of faith. And that's what I'm afraid many of our members have fallen into. Works, deeds of the law. 
and some go to the opposite extreme and they think that justification means that the law is just done away. That's the re that's the, 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 the vast majority of Christians today, nominal Christians. Oh, the law is done away. We don't need it. We're free in Christ. We are free, so let us just do whatever we wish. As long as we profess that Jesus is the Lord, uh, you know, everything is fine. No, no, brethren. Because many feel that they are justified when they do nothing more than just profess Jesus Christ or believe on his name in some public or private profession of belief. And they may feel we don't need to be baptized even or even repent in the true, in the true sense of that word, brethren. Not, not so. Absolutely not so. But we will address true repentance. We will address faith. We are going to address all these key things that I said that are just key in our Christian life. And that we have to be knowledgeable about. You know, we are not fo we are followers of Jesus Christ. We are not going to be following any philosophy of this world and any, 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 any person of this world. Or look at these, these churches. They are just named after their people. They are just named after their doctrines. You know, I'll just take the, the, the I'll just take the, the example doctrines the, the, the Seventh Day Adventists. They're named after the doctrine Advent. It's it's a Latin Latin word for the coming, the return of Jesus Christ. They've named themselves in the 19th century, when for a brief for a brief while, if you look at God's uh, history of the true church, and yeah, you have you have my teachings on my YouTube channel channel of that. Uh, for a long time, uh, when, when the Millerite movement uh, got disintegrated in America, many of those, they were just Sunday keepers, by the way, they came in touch with us, with Church of God. <laughs> but they thought the name was just too general. It doesn't, doesn't, really, doesn't really say what we believe. So they, 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 they just went their own way, the Adventists, modern Adventists. They organized their own conference and they formed... They formed the Seventh Day Adventist Church. You see, they're just pointing out that the Seventh Day, and they're just pointing out they're waiting for the return of Christ. But brethren, look at them today. Look at them today. Do they believe? Many of them, you would think they're waiting for Jesus Christ. Well, his return is never closer. You would think that they would be, they would be examining their lives. They would be watching closely after the, over their deeds. Not at all. Many of them, you cannot really find much difference between them and the rest of the world uh, in the way of thinking, in the way of acting. There is no much different between, difference between them and the rest of the world other than that they just keep the seven-day Sabbath strictly. That's, that's what it is important to them. But again, I'm asking you. And they're a bunch of dummies. If you would just tell them, you know, something... That they should be all, I don't know, go to sleep in bed at 8 o'clock. They would probably, many of them would probably do that just without thinking. Sometimes you cannot go early to sleep because you've got work, you've got other things, children, obligations, you know, and so on and so forth. And I'm speaking from my perspective. Often I stay very late at night because I have some urgent things to review. I have somebody to talk to. I have... You know, I have requests, I have baptism requests, I have got right now, I'm having four baptism requests, and all four of them are not in Serbia, by the way, all four of them are in foreign lands. Meaning, I would have to leave my whatever chores I have here, and I would have to just stay, and, and, and I'll just have to go and stay in other countries to perform my pastoral duties, and that's fine, that's part of my life. But what I'm saying is sometimes I don't really, I cannot really afford to go to sleep at 8, 8 p.m. No way. No way. It has to be later and sometimes it's well after midnight. But it's okay. I don't mind. Because I'm here. If I'm here to be uh, an elder, if I'm here to be a servant, I have to sacrifice my time and sometimes sacrifice whatever things for the sake of God's people. And that's, that's, that's a privilege from God. It's sometimes it is it is exhausting. Sometimes it's tiring. It's sometimes it's it's terrible, especially if people have got rotten attitude. But that's a part of my life, and it's okay. But back to the Adventists. What does their name mean today? Seventh day. Well, most of the world thinks seventh day is the Sunday anyway. 
But okay, Adventists, they would just have to think, what would that be? Check, check out in a dictionary, oh, a soon return of Jesus Christ, but yeah. But I mean, from, from, from seeing a bunch of Adventists, many of them, you just see that they follow the seven. That they just follow, you know, the seventh day, and they just follow follow the name. But the name means nothing. Christ is almost there, knocking at the door. Christ is sooner than ever. They don't even keep the holiday, which just commemorates Christ's return, which is the day of the day of the Feast of Trumpets, the day of trumpets, or the day of trumpet blast, which would be much better translation to, of that. And then if you would ask them, what, what is justification? Oh, they would probably tell you like the rest of humanity. Oh, to accept Jesus in your heart. Oh, really? So in all this confusion, what is then the truth, you may ask? Well, the Bible teaching. We go to the Bible teaching. Now, the best place to begin with is a simple definition. To justify means to prove or pronounce one blameless of some wrong act. So you've done something wrong, we have all done in our previous lives many things wrong, and then God said, okay, you're blameless of those wrong acts and you're now free. In everyday English communication, people in the countries whose English is this native tongue, they use the term to describe what people try to do when they're indeed guilty but wish to talk their way out of some trouble by denying their guilt. And we have it all in our cultures. Yeah, we know how people try to just wiggle, wiggle out of responsibility. Have you noticed in our world what the world is always all about? Rights. Our rights. We have right for this. We have right for that. Right for this. Right for that. Where is the word responsibility? Have you ever heard of it? And that's what you have to teach your local congregations, brethren. Responsibility. Yes, there are rights. But there are also responsibilities. And God wants his people to be responsible. And to be responsible ambassadors for Christ. Not just to, you know, go with the flow in the society, but just be different because we keep the different days. And, you know, just be because we don't eat unclean stuff. But in the Bible, justification is not what a person says about himself or herself, but what God himself does for the person. That's what it is. And to be justified in Bible usage means to be pronounced not guilty, not because one has not done wrong, but because one has been forgiven by God for the wrong done. Do we get it? And for proof... What is justification? Uh, that it's forgiveness of sin. For that proof, you can go to Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3. And you can go, you can start in verse 21. Basically, this section, verse 21 through 31, tells us about that. But we can, we can read at least a few verses. Verse 21. But now the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed. Have you read it? Apart from the law. Oh, interesting. Now you have to keep the law in order to be, you know, imputed righteousness and justification. But listen now too. So righteousness apart from the law is revealed, being witnessed by the law, uh -huh, by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ. Here we are. Righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ. There is, yes, I know it sounds Protestantish, but there is nothing wrong to say because it's written here in the Bible. And once again, please get out of your mind that keeping of the law is going to get you into the kingdom and make you, oh yeah, it's part of Christian life. It's only part. And keeping of the law is sign between God and us. But the witness to the world that so many of you or some of you are so keen to show, it is not that we just cram to the world that we keep the Sabbath and we keep the holidays. No. To show the world that our characters have changed. To show the world that our deceitful hearts have been changed, converted. That's what is the witness to the world. You know. 
that people see that our characters differ from the rest of the world. That's what it is. Please get it because I'm afraid many people over the centuries have not got it, you know. And they thought that the greatest distinction between them and the world is that they keep the Sabbath and the holidays. No, no, and no. Sabbath and holidays have nothing to do with the world. It says in the Bible it's a sign between God's people and God himself. The world needs to see Christ in us. You see? And to see Christ in us, we need to understand why we are justified and how. So it says, even, verse 22, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all and all who believe. For there is no difference. For all have sinned, verse 23, and fall short of the glory of God. That's all of us. We had all sinned, brethren. And we still continue to sin because the Apostle John says what? Whoever says there is no sin in him, he is a liar and the truth is not in him. Being justified, he is verse 24, being justified freely. How? By what? By keeping the Sabbath and holidays? No. By his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance God had passed over the sins that were previously committed. Oh, so yes, we're all guilty. We committed sin, but yeah, yeah, yeah. You're just, you're just justified. God says as if you have not done anything wrong. To demonstrate, verse 26, at the present time his righteousness that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. That's why right, baptism, all of you were asked, I hope, I'm not sure I've not been all over the place to know it, but I, at least I'm the one when I have, when I performed the, the act of baptism, I asked, have you, have you received the redemptive sacrifice of Jesus Christ? Have you received his sacrifice? Have you accepted his sacrifice as your savior, as your king, soon coming king and ruler and so on? Verse 27. Where is boasting, boasting then? Well, I'm asking you, where is boasting then? Many of our members seem to be boasting, oh, they keep the Sabbath. Oh, that makes them so different from all these pagans around. Yes, it does. But it's a sign, the Sabbath is a sign between us and God. And all those pagans around us should see our different characters, our different hearts and minds and way of thinking. And when we open up to speak, that they hear different words that they wouldn't hear from the common communication in, in our surroundings, which is just full of the foul words and, 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 and rotten attitudes and all that. Where is the boasting then? It is excluded. By what law? Of works? No, but by the law of faith. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law. You see, it's apart from the deeds of the law. It does not exclude the deeds of the world. But it's apart. Apart. Separate. It doesn't matter that if we keep the law, anybody could keep the law, ritually anyway. And not have enough faith in Christ. If you have faith in Christ, you're going to be very careful how you behave, how you act, how you communicate, how you think. Therefore, verse 28, we conclude that a man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law. Or, is he the God of the Jews only? Now, you may wonder why he mentions the Jews. Well, he mentions the Jews because the Jews, even to this day, are known for the deeds of the law. You know, all of the Jewish life, when you analyze it, everything is just the deeds. From the moment you wake up, you know, what, 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 what leg are you going to stand upon first, left or right? Yeah, it's all regulated. Haha, <laughs> you may find it funny, but it's true. And I'm partly Jewish and I know it. Then, what shoelace should you first tie? Should it be the shoelace on the, you know, on the left or the right hand? And then, you know, what should you wear? Underneath, you need to wear this to remind you of this, that, and the other. You need to do it. It's just deeds after deeds after deeds after deeds. The whole Jewish religion is 
made up of this, well, it doesn't differ from the rest of the worldly religions anyway. But that's why the Jews were known that back in those days as, you know, religion of the deeds, and that's why he mentions the Jews here. Verse 29, or he, is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not also the God of the Gentiles, meaning of all the rest of the world? Yes, of the Gentiles also, since there is one God who will justify, who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith. You see, Jewish people were circumcised, but if they accepted in faith Jesus Christ, they would be justified. Those who were not circumcised, you know, they, they were circumcised at baptism because at baptism, symbolically, figuratively, Jesus Christ circumcises not our flesh, but our heart. That's what I've been telling you all along, brethren. We have to pre preach the gospel primarily by our hearts being changed. Because Jeremiah 79 is the diagnosis of all of us, deceitful hearts, desperately wicked. We have all sinned and fallen from the grace of God, yes. Then comes baptism and baptism. We are circumcised heart. Our heart is circumcised. Have you taught your congregations that? Do your congregations know that, I'm asking you? Because the, the, the religious life of this world is so superficial. You know, oh, just accept Jesus. Jesus, except Jesus is the Lord and you are justified. You're justified. You're free from, from, from the law. You're free to do whatever. Brethren, it's just, just totally superficial. And if you think we're going to be educators in the kingdom of God like that, you're deadly wrong. No, we are not. Verse 30. Since there is one God who will justify, justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith, do we then make void the law through faith? Oh, certainly not. Certainly not. On the contrary, we establish the law. Well, exactly. When people see that your heart is different, that you are different in your attitude, in your mind, in your speech, in your treatment of animals, in your treatment of your land, in your way of thinking, people will then see, of course, oh, oh, by the way, those people keep, keep different days. Why do they do that? Brethren, first things first. What is between us and God and all the holidays and sun Sabbath is between us and God? It's a sign that we're his people. It is, in a good way, a sign to the world that we are different, that we're God's people. Yes, but since people don't understand really the holidays and the Sabbath, even more, what will be even more greater, deeper, more impressive witness to them is to see our characters different. That's why I've been telling you. So many people in the Church of God, and I'm speaking in the broadest sense of, of, of the words, Church of God, have stopped at the point of, oh, we keep the Sabbath, and we keep the holidays, and yes, we're on the right track, wonderful. We're so different than all these other pagans. Fine, great. In the meantime, they don't grow in anything. They don't grow in any knowledge. They don't grow in any understanding. There is no way you can enter the kingdom of God if you don't grow in knowledge and understanding, because that's what it says in the Bible, in the New Testament, that we are to grow in grace and knowledge. So what I'm telling you today about justification is that part of growing in, yes, grace and knowledge. And various other things we'll be, we'll be addressing as the key Christian things will be addressing, of course, again, grace and knowledge. We have to grow in that, brethren. Conversion is a deeper process than just keeping certain days, which are commanded by God, which are blessed by God, yes, indeed. Because you remember with the Sabbath at the creation week, God hallowed it, God blessed it, and set it apart. So all those who keep this day are set apart by God, no question about it. As you see, it says, does this justification by faith mean that we have annulled the law? No, certainly not. We have even established the law, exactly. So don't get me wrong and don't misread what I'm saying. We are to keep the law without any compromise because it's for us and it is signed between us and God that we are his people. When it comes to witnessing to the world, like many of you are so keen about here, and I'm happy that you are, 
because God has obviously put that desire in you. Well, that's great. Great. Number one, first of all, not all of your kinsmen are called to salvation now. That's number one. So be, be fine with that. And number two, what people are to see in us primarily above all other things is that we are people of integrity and truth. And when they see that our characters are different, that our hearts are no longer deceitful and desperately wicked, when they see that we are just different because the power of the Spirit of God has changed us, then they will scratch their heads and think, well, something is different with these people. What is it? Then they will start thinking, well, they keep the Sabbath, why? They don't eat certain things, why? They don't keep certain holidays, why? Why, why? And of course, that will just lead them. Then you can give them the answer to that. But the primary thing that will just draw them to ask those questions is not that we keep the Sabbath and holidays, because it will be odd enough anyway. The primary reason will be that they've seen that we're different people. That they see Christ's example in us. That's what's the point of being a witness, you know. So also you can see in Romans, we're in Romans, and you can see in uh, chapter, you can go to chapter 5 in Romans. Uh, Romans chapter 5, because in chapter 5 in Romans, we're going to see the justification is made possible by the shed blood of Christ. Not by all of our law keeping and stuff, but but they shed blood. We that's why we accept the, uh, the the that's why at at Passover we renew our acceptance of the blood of Christ for the remission of our sins. Verse uh, verse nine in chapter five in Romans five nine he says much more than having now been justified by His blood we shall be saved from wrath through Him. So justification is made possible by the shed blood of Christ. And after our total spiritual cleansing by God, you see, that's what it happens. Do you realize that's exactly the process of baptism? You know, people have to understand that if they want to receive the Holy Spirit. You know, God cannot have any touch with, 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 with sin. And therefore, uh, therefore, we are first, why are we first being plunged into the water so that the blood of Christ will completely cleanse us from all the sin ever done in faith, in, uh, in, 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 in lack of faith, for all the sins we have done in words, in, uh, in deeds, in thoughts, we're completely cleansed. And only in that clean vessel can God then place His Holy Spirit. That, that's why after plunging into the water, that's why comes the laying on of hands and the prayer that God from heaven will send that Spirit into the minds of the new converts. That's what it is. And so we are just, you know, spiritually being cleansed by God. And the blood of Christ then continues to cleanse us because we're still sinful, you know. After our baptism, we still have the pull of our flesh. We have the compromising, compromising situations. We have the uh, attractions from this world. You know, the blood of Christ continues to cleanse us. And we, at, at, at Passover, we recept, we renew our acceptance of Christ. That's why we take a cup of wine. How many of your congregants do understand that, brethren? Because all of those things that I'm talking about can be just ritual without deeper understanding of what it is. What's the point, you see? We cannot be just dummies that follow certain certain ideology, in this case, Bible doctrines. We cannot be just dummies without following that, without understanding what it means in our lives. Because then it has no spiritual effect, effect at all. And so after our spiritual, total spiritual cleansing by God, God views us as being righteous, you see. As we have just read in Romans chapter 3, verse 21 and 22, this righteousness is something, is not something we earn. There is nothing we can do to earn it. We cannot keep, we can keep the, the law of God all the time. We cannot earn righteousness. Rather, it's imputed to us when we are justified by faith. God forgives us totally and gives us his own spirit of righteousness, you see. Now, if you go to Romans chapter 4, in Romans chapter 4, verse 1 through 8, it says that God imputes, God imputed, that is, he credited Abraham with righteousness, the father of our faith. Because why did he credit Abraham you know, with righteousness, well, because of Abraham's faith. And just, just think about Abraham for a minute. Those of you who think we have heart in life. What about your only son? 
Abraham, take your only son and go sacrifice him. Horrendous. Horrendous. But what, what, when you remember the biblical record, what do we find in the biblical record? Abraham starting to argue with God. Abraham starting to saying, oh, no, 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 you cannot do that. But this is what is the pagan religion. No, you got me out of that. No, nothing of the sort. Abraham was probably puzzled, but Abraham just did. Obeyed without any unconditional, without any question, you see. What a test of faith. And just wonder, if you were tested like that, how many of us would pass that test? I don't really know. But Abraham passed it. And because of that, Abraham was credited, or it was imputed with righteousness because of his faith, which resulted in his what? In his justification. Abraham had not earned such favor, brethren, but God imputed righteousness uh, to him after forgiving his sins because Abraham had faith. Romans 4, Romans 4, 1. What then shall we say that Abraham, our father, has found according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he was something, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? And then he quotes the Old Testament. Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him or imputed to him or credited to him as for righteousness. Now to him who works, the wages are not counted as grace, but as debt. <laughs> but to him who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted for his righteousness. Just as David also describes the bla uh, blessedness of the man to whom God imputes righteousness apart from works. Here's a quote from David. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord shall not impute sin. Yes, he's blessed because God, Lord, imputes to him what? He imputes to him uh, forgiveness, justification, if you wish. And so what we have just read just shows us again that Abraham had not earned such favor. God imputed righteousness to him after forgiving his sins because Abraham had faith. But you see, forgiveness of sin, friends and brethren, forgiveness of sin coupled with a pronouncement of righteousness, meaning justification, does not come automatically. It certainly has conditions. And here is where many jump the track, you see. But we as true Christians must not jump the track. For one thing, man cannot justify himself. That's number one. It is something that God must do. Jesus upbraided the Pharisees because they sought to justify themselves before others. Before others, you see. All there, that's what we can do also. Make a show program for others. Go to Luke 16. Luke, the Gospel of Luke, chapter 16. We can make show to the others, just like Pharisees were doing the show, show for the masses. And what was their righteousness? It was, it was just like filthy rags, to quote prophet Isaiah. You know, because they were doing that to be justified by men and to have and to, 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 to gain converts. They were not doing it. It was not anything of God that was involved in their life, imputing to them righteousness. Indeed, 16 chapter Luke chapter 16 and verse 15. And he said to them, Jesus Christ to the Pharisees, You are those who justify yourselves before men, but God knows your hearts. <laughs> Heart again, friends and brethren. Heart. Desperately wicked. Who can understand it? The diagnosis of the whole humanity, the diagnosis that we all have. And we are all being healed, you might say, being treated by God. We're being treated for all that diagnosis. But once again, Christ to the Pharisees, You are those who justify yourself before men, but God knows your hearts. For what is highly esteemed among men is an abomination in the sight of God. Huh? What do you say? What is esteemed in all of our societies and cultures and all of that? We all grew up in societies and cultures. What is esteemed, meaning, of course, all those things that are wrong and pagan and so on, is just abomination in the sight of God. To take one example, oh, to be a right man, 
a true man, you know, you need to have as many premarital sexual experiences as you can, and you need to be this. It's abomination to God. To be a true believer, you have to be now preparing for the Christmas. Christmas carols are singing all over the place, you know, and Santa Claus is coming to town and all of that. Brethren, abomination to God. Just to give you those two most outstanding examples at this time of the year. So that's what, what the Pharisees were doing. Trying to, seeking to justify themselves before others. Man cannot do it. Brethren, man cannot do it. It has to come from God. And certainly people cannot justify themselves with verbal pronouncements of innocence. For, you know, they're not innocent. We've just read in Romans 3.23, all, 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 the whole humanity has sinned and fallen from the grace and from the favor of God. And repentance, meaning in Hebrew, teshuva, meaning going back the other way, is that we have to now turn around, if we are to become true Christians, we are to turn around and we are to go the other way. The Pharisees in the parable that the publican, you have the parable of the publican and the Pharisee in Luke chapter 18, if you wouldn't mind going there. Luke chapter 18, brethren, the Pharisee in that parable of the publican and the Pharisee, he tried this approach, you know, <laughs> he tried this approach. Look at, look at his approach, Luke 18 verse 9. Also he spoke this parable, Jesus Christ, to some who trusted in themselves. <laughs> that they were righteous and despised others. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee and tax collectors in those days were just the, uh, the, most despicable, uh, 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 the most despicable category of people. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank you that I am not like other men. You know, we, it just sounds like some of us Christians. We thank you, God. We're not like other men. We keep all the Sabbaths and we keep the holidays and we don't eat unclean meats. Oh, really? Fine. Here is the Pharisee. Extortioners, unjust. I'm like the, no, not like the other men. Extortioners for, you know, unjust, adulterers, or even as this tax collector. I fast, fast twice a week. Oh, this Pharisee was even more righteous than us, brethren. How many of us fast twice a week? I give tithes of all that I possess. And the tax collector standing afar off would not even, not so much as raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast saying, God be merciful to me, a sinner. And then the Lord Jesus Christ tells us, I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. You know. But Christ, you know, said, the publican, you see, not the Pharisee, went down to his house justified. The publican truly repented of his sins, you see. And God imputed his own righteousness to him. And speaking of that, from one of my very recent experiences, I have to just uh, remind you that in Second Peter chapter 1, you'll find that those who don't love their brethren, those who hate their brothers, they have forgiven, they have forgotten the remission of their former sins, the forgiveness of their past sins. As simply as that. Now this Pharisee, obviously, was so blind he doesn't even see there his sins. <laughs> and he's not justified, of course. So the public truly repented and God imputed his own righteousness. His own righteousness to him. Huh? What do you say? In Romans chapter 4, we just read, it says that Abraham was not justified by works, but by faith. In Romans 3.20, we just read that by deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. In verse 28 of the same chapter 3, it says, A man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law. To all of that, you can add Galatians 3.11, which confirms that no one is justified by the law. And also in Galatians again, chapter 2 verse 16, repeats that a man is not justified by the works 
of the law. Now, you may understand, you may say, oh, we all have faith and believe in Jesus Christ. Okay, sure. But hopefully now you understand, brethren, what that faith implies. And why do we have to accept the sacrifice of Jesus Christ? So do not mean us misunderstand, please. These verses do not mean that we need not to keep the law. Not at all. More on this we can have at some other time. For now, however, please please notice plainly that one, one person cannot earn justification by anything he or she alone says or does. And then the question you may ask, well, okay, how can then we be justified? How can we find forgiveness and have God's righteousness imputed to us? Fair question. First, we must realize that it all happens by God's grace. After all, we are, as Romans 3.24 says, justified freely by His grace. Not by how much law we keep. So grace is simply, what is grace? Grace is unmerited favor. To be justified by grace, therefore, means that justification is a gift that God gives, not something we earn. It is given because of God's goodness, not ours. Second, justification is through faith. In Acts chapter 13, verse 39, you will find that it says that those who believe, so those who have faith, are justified. In Romans 3.26, it concurs that God is the justifier of one who has faith in Jesus. And also you can find that in Galatians, we can see now in Galatians chapter 3, to corroborate all these, all these verses in Acts 13.39 and Romans 3.26. We can go now to Galatians and read in... Um, Chapter 3, verse 8. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel to Abraham beforehand, saying, In you all the nations shall be blessed. Look at please also verse 24. Therefore the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ, that we might be justified by faith. So the law is still there. He brought us to Christ. And now we are just, you know, when we receive the Spirit of the Christ, the Holy Spirit, we just keep the law in spirit and in faith. That's the only proper way to keep the law, by the way. You must have the whole, God's Holy Spirit, you see, to properly keep the law by faith. You know, and uh, faith is belief that God exists and that He will do what He says He will. That's what Hebrews eleven sixteen teaches us. Eleven Hebrews eleven sixteen is the basic definition of faith. And when God calls a person and grants that person a gift of repentance, because Romans two four says, "Don't you know, all you man, that the goodness of God leads you to repentance." Then God extends forgiveness to the person when he or she turns from sin and begins to obey God. And hence, justification involves grace and faith. Grace and faith, as Rome, you'll find in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, it says, It's by grace through faith. It is because of God's favor, not our own goodness, but faith is a necessary condition. As bad as we are, when we have faith, that's a necessary condition, and then it leads us to justification, which is free gift given to us by God. But even this faith is not something that person alone supplies. True faith is, again, a gift from God, Frederick. All that we have in spiritual realm is a gift from God, including the faith, you see. And it's because God's, of God's favor and not our own goodness. But faith is a necessary condition. But even it's from God, you know. True faith, it's not found naturally in any of us. If you read Galatians 5.22, you'll find it there. But yet it requires a person's cooperation. It's not natural to us. Yes, God is working with us, but it requires our cooperation. We just are to be willing to open up ourselves and our hearts, with those diagnoses, to open our hearts for the God Spirit to work in us and change the hearts and minds, the way we think, the way we behave, the way we act. And here, here is how it works. When God decides to call a person 
that person at first responds to God with only human belief. But it is believed backed by action because in James 2.26 we know it says faith without works is, what is faith without works? Dead. So yes, we have faith. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. We have works. Yes, indeed. But the works do not justify us, do not save us. It's faith in Christ's sacrifice and his resurrection into life that gives us justification as a gift. The first action that we have when it comes to works is repentance. That's the act of ceasing to sin and changing one's whole life to obey God in everything God commands. The next step is baptism, as you know, which follows after belief in repentance. You know from Acts 2.38, the, uh, the, the Pentecost, the first New Testament Pentecost, in which, you know, the Apostle Peter says, please, you know, be... Please be rescue yourself from this perverted generation. He said it in the first century. Think about how perverted generations are in our 21st century. It is only at baptism that one's sins are finally forgiven. And it's only then that we are justified and our sins are covered by Christ's shed blood and his death, as we read in Romans 5 verse 9. As a result of baptism and the laying on of hands by one of God's servants, we receive God's Spirit and we are filled with true faith. Brethren, these are important things. I'm just, uh, we'll go through the uh, topic of baptism and uh, through the topic of repentance because people before they need to be introduced to all of that. They have to understand it's not like a, a motion circus. Oh, I'm being immersed. Oh, wonderful, great. Hands are being laid on me. Wonderful, great. And the Spirit of God will come into me. Well, brethren, they have to understand what does immersion imply and what is what is the deep meaning or at least deeper meaning of baptism at a certain point but then perhaps you know as they grow in grace and knowledge they may understand even deeper and deeper you know as you have the spiritual life and various challenges there then you understand why you had to be baptized because by your own self by your own nature by your own strength you could not earn anything you could not earn anything you could not even overcome all those sins you wouldn't even have desire to overcome it because the carnal mind, we were all born with carnal minds. Carnal mind is naturally what? Enemy against God. It doesn't like the God's, God's law, doesn't want to keep God's law, doesn't have desire to have anything to do with God. You see, brethren, we were just born like that. And the rest of humanity is in that category. And therefore, because they're not called now. And there is no reason that any of you should be frustrated. And, oh, we don't have we don't have so many members of the church. Oh, we don't have so many followers. God doesn't want you to have followers. God wants to have followers of Christ who will be congregating, you know, well-educated, well-knowledgeable, well-founded in the Bible, you know, to be congregated, to keep... Uh, you know, and serve him on certain days. That's what God wants. He doesn't want you to have thousands of people from, I don't know, your, your hometowns, you know, packing your church halls and stuff. That's not what God wants. That's not what you were called for anyway. We are called to give a witness. The gospel of the kingdom of God, Matthew 24, 14, will be preached for a witness, not for conversion. Keep that in mind. Some people just confuse that. For a witness. And I've just I've been telling you, pondering you from the Bible, what is the first witness? Changed hearts. Out of out of heart the mouth speaks. Out of our mouths should be should not be coming out foul things. Curses. You know, out of our mouths should come edifying words. Oh, but it's so different from us. Yes, it is. That's why we're ambassadors for Christ. We're different. We represent different kingdom. One day people will understand that when Christ comes back and opens up their mind and subjects them all who are here in flesh and blood, subjects them to the government of God. Made up of Christ and his saints. One day they will understand it. In the meantime, they're not. you're not to be worried that oh and to think you're unsuccessful because whole village in this area did not turn to christ or some few people and only one person in this town and one two persons in that village it doesn't matter it's god's prerogative to call whom he wants don't meddle into god's business your business is to allow the spirit of god to change your hearts and minds 
Your business today and mine, brethren, is to be ambassadors for Jesus Christ, the Savior of, of mankind. Our business is not to convert the world. No, 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 and no. That's what Protestants are trying to do, and look how miserably they're failing anyway. Currently, how many wars, starvations, and all of that? Yeah, if people were converted, things like that wouldn't happen, but they're not. God is calling only few now for the salvation, few to be in his kingdom, and that's what it is. So as a result of baptism and the laying of our hands by one of God's servants, we receive God's spirit and we are filled with true faith. And thus the process starts with human belief, but leads to Christ's own faith being placed in us, you see. But why does God justify only those with faith, belief that causes them to act? Well, the answer is that one who truly believes, God only disobeys out of weakness of the flesh and the pulls of Satan, you know. So that one who truly believes God only disobeys out of weakness of the flesh and the pulls of Satan, and he does not intend to disobey. We live still in the Satan's world. Is that any, 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 to all of you, it shouldn't be any special revelation. I hope all of you understand we live in Satan's world. That's why the things in the world are like, like they are. They're going to be drastically changed when Jesus Christ comes and installs the government of God back into this earth. I say back because obviously, uh, or, or, or perhaps I should better say when he comes and installs for the first time the government because he tried to restore it through Ad, uh, Abraham, uh, through not Abraham, but Adam and Eve. He, he just failed because Adam and Eve just disobeyed. So, okay, what God needs to establish here will be his kingdom, which is uh, being, being ruled by his law. And his law is going to be administered by Christ and his saints. Who are keeping that law now and who are being obviously educated through that law it was a tutor to bring us to christ it says right so they're being educated now to administer that law in the world to come the kingdom of god cannot be made of flesh and blood says paul in first corinthians therefore the kingdom of god will be christ and his resurrected saints changed transformed saints that will be the kingdom of God and this humanity, those who remain alive at Christ's return, those people will be subjected to the government of God. So we live in a satanic world and Christians do not intend to disobey. We constantly, they constantly strive to obey God with God's help. A Christian lives under God's grace and God continues to justify him and impute righteousness to him, you see. A person without faith thinks he knows better than God. <laughs> oh, don't we live? Surrounded by people who all think they know better than God. He wants those people, you know, who have no faith. They want to follow their own way. They intend to disobey God and they will disobey God because carnal mind, as you read in Romans 8, is against God anyway. But you see, faith is the difference, brethren. Faith coupled with the good works, that's what it is going to be great witness to the world greater than anything else. That's what Christ meant when he said that the gospel will be preached as a witness. You see, faith is the difference. Therefore, God requires faith which is trust in him to justify us. But the one final piece must be put into the justification puzzle at this point. Many believe that once you are justified, you need not to keep God's law. That's what many so-called Christians believe. But to say we are not justified by the law, which is true, is something totally different from saying that we don't need to keep the law, which is false. Romans 2.13 makes that plain. It says, For not the hearers of the law are just in the sight of God, but the doers of the law will be justified. Romans 2.13 So what can be said in plainer language, brethren? And if you add to that Romans 3.31 that we have just read, do we then make void the law through faith? Certainly not. On the contrary, we establish the law. So you will not be saved because... Your obedience earns salvation, but your disobedience can and will disqualify you from salvation. 
and uh, basically that would be about the justification now let me just enumerate to you basic scriptures about the topic you can jot them down and uh, and perhaps review them later if you missed any of them and then we'll just have conclusion of all this matter so some basic scriptures about the topic of justification romans 3 verse 21 through 31 which says all have sinned and need to be justified justification includes the forgiveness of, of sin romans 4 verse 3 justification also includes the imputing of righteousness and i said you have to jot this down those of you who are not taking the notes you better change that very bad habit because in a school any school that you go you always have your you always have their you know pens pens pencils notebooks whatever and then you just jot down all those certain things if you go to college as well if you go to faculty or university you just always take the notes of the most important points being said well this is the school the church of god hope of israel worldwide church of god is a school for eternal life so please those of you and many simply don't have habit to take the notes please change that wrong habit get a notebook get a notebook that will be you know that'll be for 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 taking notes and as you listen to any bible message try to try to jot down write down the most important points because that's what any school does so you can review those points later or you can just be reminded or you can just have them for your reference because you'll need it yes we'll have all of this material i'm preaching about these doctrinal outlines we'll have them eventually in written form but it's good for you to develop a good attitude a good attention attitude for attention for focus for directing your mind to the, the, the subject is good for your, for you to develop the attitude of taking notes even if those notes would be on the margins of your bible why not brethren the bible is not a holy book it's not a holy item that it should be just you know uh, it should be all clear and no what is written in the bible is holy but the book itself is not holy so make that book your textbook nothing wrong with that on the contrary it's time for us Christians to, you know, step out of the wrong, stupid ideas of this world around us and to behave differently as ambassadors for Christ. Jotting down Romans 5 verse 9, justification is made possible by Christ's sacrifice. Luke chapter 16 verse 15, we cannot justify ourselves. Romans 4 verse 1 through 8, Galatians coupled with Galatians 2 verse 16 and Galatians 3 11, we are not justify, justified by the law or works. Ephesians 2 8, we are justified by God's grace through faith. Romans chapter 2 verse 13, Romans 3 verse 31, James chapter 4, chapter 2, sorry, James chapter 2 verse 14 through 26, works and law keeping law keeping and works are both necessary although they don't justify us so conclusion brethren god's forgiveness of our sins and imputing of righteousness to us is a wonderful blessing made possible by the sacrifice of jesus christ and once justified by god we just like a criminal pardon for his crime can begin again with a brand new lease on life.